Hello, Nutrition 115 students, and welcome to Unit 21 or Chapter 21, Phytochemicals. Now, phytochemicals, I want you to look at this word. Phyto means plant in Greek, literally. So phytochemicals are chemicals found in plants. Phyto means plant, once again. Um, the what else in your food, I like to, we like to call it as well. Now, phytochemicals, um, I also want to say, though, that some vitamins do act as phytochemicals as well. They're not considered phytochemicals, but they act as phytochemicals because they have, in addition to uh, serving as coenzymes and chemical reactions, they also have other roles as well, which are similar to phytochemicals. But phytochemicals are not vitamins. They are substances found in plants or these chemicals found in plants that are usually uh, have a higher health benefit and related to uh, diseases, disorders, and conditions. Uh, also called phytonutrients, that's another name for them. Uh, they're most biologically active substances. So again, they're very biologically active substances found in plants. They provide health promoting functions. Like I said, they have a, a, a relation with um, um, diseases, disorders, and conditions. Uh, they're derived from plants. Um, zoo chemicals also exist. Um, if you ever heard of omega-3s, which come from fish, that's an example of a zoo chemical, which has been found to fight arthritis and certain brain disorders. So these zoo chemicals, again, when you go to a zoo, you go to see animals. So just think of it that way. So zoo chemicals are these powerful chemical substances that are found in animals, okay? Um, foods of animal origin that also contain biologically active substances that affect body press processes like omega-3s. Um, and again, omega-3s are also lipids that are, vital, are essential for the health, but also serve as um, zoo chem, also called a zoo chemical because it's related to a disorder, health, or, or disease. It's much uh, less is known about these zoo chemicals than are the phytochemicals, just so you know. Phytochemicals continued. Um, so in your book, you have uh, many examples of phytochemicals. There's hundreds of them, okay? And there's even more that are being discovered. And as you see here uh, in black pepper, uh, we see niacin and calcium. So we see some minerals and vitamins that um, can also serve as phytochemicals as well because they have something related to diseases or disorders and conditions, okay? Um, but what we're going to do is I'm going to focus on some in your, in your book. Um, I'm not really going to go through the ones that I have listed on the PowerPoint slides towards the end. It's, I'm really going to leave it up to you to study the PowerPoint slides and read your book. Um, and I give you some information just as a guide, um, but I want to go over more about the functions, the roles, um, some major foods that they're found in, um, and also highlight some diseases, disorders, and conditions that they're applicable to. Characteristics of phytochemicals, again, they're functions in plants because they're found in plants. Um, some phytochemicals, just to be on, um, according to your book, they play a variety of roles. Uh, for, they also give, like vitamins, they give color to a lot of fruits and vegetables. For example, there's a phytochemical called lycopene that's responsible for giving the red hue to watermelon and tomatoes. They do provide protection against bacterial, viral, and fungal infections. They also serve in plants um, when they're in nature to ward off insects, so they're like insect repellents. And they pre also prevent tissue damage due to oxidation. So a lot of the phytochemicals are also antioxidants like vitamins. They're actually quite powerful ones in regards to diseases. Uh, they provide protection, again, like I just named, against bacterial, viral, and fungal infections. They ward off insects as well. Um, some of them prevent tissue damage due to oxidation. For instance, there's a phytochemical called lutein, L-U-T-E-I-N that um, is recommended as well as another phytochemical zeaxanthin that is responsible for uh, incredible eye health. So if you're one of those athletes who work out a lot during uh, the day when there's a lot of, uh, during the summer when there's a lot of sun that can damage your eyes, either wear eyeglasses in addition to that, take a, um, a supplement or eat foods that are high in zeaxanthin and uh, lutein, which include things like uh, blueberries, um, um, even spinach contains it as well. It's either used, some of them are used in energy processes. They act as plant hormones as well, so they initiate certain cascade effects. They provide plants with flavor and color, like I said before, uh, like lycopene, the red hue, and watermelon. And so if you ever wondered why brown eggs are brown, um, they are due to a phytochemical called uh, xanthophils. Xanthophils is actually a yellow orange pigment in plants. And uh, just so you know, brown eggs are laid by chickens known as Rhode Island Reds. 
And these Rhode Island Reds, they consume foods such as yellow corn or alfalfa, and they contain xanthophils. So you are what you eat, okay? I do want you to know there's more than 2,000 types of phytochemicals that act as pigments that have been identified so far, and I think there are more. Uh, sometimes the color of phytochemicals contained in plants is obscured. I want you to know, for example, dark green vegetables, for example, are often good sources of orange and yellow carotenes, but the green chlorophyll obscures the colors. So here's an example. Chickens consume yellow corn alfalfa with xanthophils, uh, these Rhode Island reds, um, and that causes the brown eggs. Well, again, I named, I already mentioned there's more than 2,000 types that have been identified. Uh, sometimes the color of phytochemicals contained in the plant is obscured. I just uh, identified that earlier. Um, now here's the example. Many phytochemicals are colorist as well. You can't always identify which sources of phytochemicals by their color. For example, uh, someone once said they wanted to avoid white foods like onions and bananas and potatoes and cauliflower because they don't contain phytonutrients because they're not very bright and colorful, but that is not uh, correct. Okay, uh, some of these, uh, these um, more bland colored fruits and vegetables also contain phytochemicals as well. So here's an example, for instance, um, remember we learned about beta carotene in the vitamin chapter, it's a provitamin for vitamin A, but also a phytochemical responsible for giving carrots their orange color. Lycopene is responsible for the red color in tomatoes. Anthocyanins is responsible for the blue to purple color in blueberries and grapes. Allicin is, the, uh, is responsible for the white color in garlic. And then lutein and zeaxanthin, those powerful eye um, phytochemicals that I mentioned, that fight off free radical damage in the eyes, um, um, provide the yellow to green color in spinach. And then the xanthophils are that yellow to orange color that is found in corn and green vegetables. So I do want you to know that current research is stating that phytochemicals exert their beneficial effects through complementary interactions with other phytochemicals and nutrients. Um, the specific functions of phytochemicals may be diminished or expanded based on these interactions. And I'm just going to give you an example. But I mentioned lutein and zeaxanthin are important for fighting off or warding off free radicals in the eye due to environmental stresses like the UV ray lights of the sun or uh, like smoking or certain um, other elements in the air. And in order to protect them, in addition to um, wearing sunglasses, you can ingest these, um, these phytochemicals. But we're, the research is showing that when they are um, combined together, zeaxanthin and lutein together for eye health, they work better than alone, OK? Functions of phytochemicals, again, I mentioned um, they're involved in a lot of combating chronic inflammation and uh, disorders and diseases. Um, so chronic inflammation is the risk for many common diseases like diabetes and arthritis, for example, and cardiovascular disease. Um, antioxidants help prevent and repel damage to cells. So uh, we are noticing that some phytochemicals help repair some of this radical damage in the cells, help get rid of some of these, uh, some of these unstable molecules. A number of phytochemicals function as antioxidants as well. So not all of them, just some of them. And I want you to know that 12, table 21.2 in your book provides a list of top food sources that have these antioxidant phyto, phytochemicals that act at antioxidants. And I've also um, put the image here on the slide. So things like pomegranates, red cabbage, blackberries, pecans, walnuts, certain um, almonds as well and um, also contain phytochemicals to help ward off, uh, for instance, um, like I mentioned, uh, certain diseases, uh, uh, the inflammation in certain diseases that occurs uh, from like diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, and um, arthritis, just for example. Age-related macular degeneration. So if you ever heard of an old person going blind due to old age, we call that macular degeneration. And um, it's an eye damage caused by the oxidation of the macula of the eye, the central part of the eye that allows you to see details. Um, antioxidant roles of lutein and zeaxanthin and beta carotene. So all three of these, when there are free radicals that are seen in um, that area of the eye, they help uh, contribute electrons so that it can be stabilized and it can remain a healthy cell. Uh, they also uh, play key roles in prevention and treatment of age-related macular degeneration as well. So if uh, someone is aging and is showing signs of poor eye health, um, or if you just want to prevent it in general, it's good to ingest these um, phytochemicals. 
antioxidant rules of flavonoids. So flavonoids, you guys, the good news about flavonoids um, has made chocolate a health food. So I want you to know, even though we find flavonoids in chocolate, uh, chocolate as a, in, uh, as a, when we look at its entire profile, it's not a best choice. Uh, cocoa as well is the main ingredient. Chocolate is a rich source of fat, but again, as it actually acts, sometimes it comes like in hot cocoa and hot cocoa can be high in sugar. So you have to look at the entire profile of a food that contains these flavonoids in order to make a decision. Flavonoids also, which include anthocyanins and quercetin, act as antioxidants and reduce inflammation. Um, regular intake of flavonoids, such as daily consumption of a cup of hot chocolate a day made with cocoa powder, is related to improved blood flow, reduced blood pressure, and decreased risk of heart disease, stroke, um, and maybe type 2 diabetes. So these flavonoids have a big role on uh, cardiovascular disease as a vital chemical category, okay? And um, quercetin, which I'm going to go on further, but here we go. They serve as antioxidants and reduce inflammation, particularly if you study research in cardiovascular disease. Um, again, it's, I talked about chocolate and, co and co uh, cocoa or cocoa, um, but some other products that contain these flavonoids um, or these ingredients um, can also be high in sugar often, okay? Also found in foods, if you want to know the natural forms in blueberries, grapes, oranges, apples, bananas, wine, and tea. Again, you don't want to overdo on that wine. Maybe to some of the best sources listed here, like the blueberries and grapes and oranges. Uh, regular intake is related to improved blood flow, like I said, reduced blood pressure and decreased risk of heart risk, um, heart disease, stroke, type 2, and certain cancers. Functions of phytochemicals in, in humans, they also have some gene function um, influences. So quercetin, for example, is a phytochemical present in apples, onions as well, and grapes, and influences inflammation by uh, modifying the expression, the turning off or on of certain genes that promote the production of pro-inflammatory compounds. Its at presence helps decrease chronic inflammation also due to excess body fat and it improves insulin utilization and may decrease bone loss. So sometimes um, this quercetin can also be related to uh, uh, certain cancers and diabetes. Um, also, there's a group of a family of vegetables that belongs to this, uh, the quercetin, um, and that is uh, the cruciferous family of vegetables that include broccoli and cauliflower. They appear to reduce the risk of certain types of cancer, particularly in people with specific uh, gene types. So uh, consumption of one half cup of a vegetable in the cruciferous family daily is sufficient to uh, decreasing inflammation in many individuals. Also resveratrol um, in the skin of red grapes also plays a role in the prevention of inflammation. Um, and it's also found not just in grapes, but tea, blueberries, cranberries, and peanuts. So a lot of times when people say what red wine has a phytochemical property that is good for heart health, they're referring to the resveratrol. Um, and again, phytochemicals and gene function, you can find quercetin, which I just talked about in apples, onions, grapes. Um, and we talked about how it influences this trend off and on of certain genes that promote inflammation in the body or these compounds. Um, and I talked about how it decreases chronic inflammation due to excess body fat, improves insulin utilization, and may decrease bone loss. And I talked about the cruciferous family. Again, they're called cruciferous because of the crisscross-like shape when they grow in their, um, in their leaves. Um, and they include broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. And I talked about consumption of one half of a cup. In these uh, of these vegetables um, is sufficient to decrease inflammation in many individuals. And a little bit more about the cruciferous family. They consist of sulfur. They can also be quite uh, gas containing. So if you are going to do like a, a vigorous workout session, do not eat these um, prior to your workout. Keep them for after. Okay. Um, so I want you to know that um, vegetables in this family, here is a list. There will be exam questions on to identify some. There are the broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, mustard and collard greens, kale, bok choy, rutabaga, turnips, and uh, watercress. So for this slide, I'm going to merely read off the PowerPoints unless I have something more to add outside of this. So anti-infection roles are proanthocyanidins and resveratrol. Uh, resveratrol, again, is in the skin of grapes, also plays a role in the prevention of inflammation, especially related to heart disease. 
Um, the phytochemical is also found not just in grapes, but peanuts, uh, tea, blueberries, and cranberries. Cranberries also have a proanthocyanidins that prevent E. coli, um, which is a and other bacteria from sticking to the walls of the urinary tract and limit urinary tract infections. So again, E. coli is this harmful pathogen or harmful ba uh, bacteria that um, can um, infect your body. And so it may prevent some of its properties it's, um, that um, in where it, it infects the body. It may, it may prevent some of that in infecting itself into the body, prevent some of those properties, okay? Uh, and that is uh, with the proanthocyanidins that we're talking about. And cranberry juice does not fully treat uh, established urinary tract, but it re does reduce some of the symptoms and helps prevent them from developing and reoccurring again. So um, I found that cranberry juice is more helpful uh, when I talk to a lot of um, OBG uh, gynecologists. It's more uh, to reduce the symptoms when you already have the infection, the urinary tract infection. Caffeine, um, so a lot of us are caffeine drinkers in here. Uh, caffeine is an example of a phytochemical, but again, it has also some negative side effects. It can decrease, like for instance, uh, calcium from bones in the prolonged period of time. Um, it can also cause heart palpitations, um, nervous disorders as well. So just make sure that you don't ingest too much. I usually tell people don't ingest more than uh, 200 milligrams a day. Um, um, maybe no more than 300, but no more than 200 milligrams just to stay healthy. Um, caffeine is an example of phytochemical, again, because it does have some antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and gene-regulating effects on body processes. Uh, most of our caffeine diet does come from coffee, unfortunately, but um, tea also has coffee. And unfortunately, I don't like this, but some soft drinks like um, the original version of Coca-Cola and energy drinks. So again, they can also have some other additives that I'm not for. Um, so it has both positive and negative health effects. But as far as the phytochemical, um, it has been um, related to decrease the risk of heart disease and certain strokes, uh, decrease the risk of Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's diseases, um, also improve mood and decrease depression. But again, there's also other phytochemicals that are found in better foods that contribute to this as well. Caffeine content, so um, up to 400 milligrams of caffeine in healthy adults does not appear to increase risks of diseases uh, that I just explained prior, like the palpitations and the nervous and the tremors and other things. But I said 200, I said half of that is better, uh, just because I don't like people to be evicted, uh, addictive um, and quite reliant on caffeine for, because um, a lot of us, actually, we drink it more for alertness than we do for the phytochemical properties of it. But as you see here, we can find it in Pepsi, call a lot of, and some diet versions as well, Red Bull, uh, chocolate, uh, some chocolate milk, and so on. And this is from your book. The functions of phytochemicals in humans, again, positive health effects of caffeine. Um, I, I actually already named a few, but others are the decreased risk of type 2, lower blood glucose levels, um, improves insulin sensitivity and insulin pro production. Again, this is all maybe. Uh, decreases the risk of death from heart disease and stroke. But again, in addition to that, it can have other side effects. Like I said, the side effects of caffeine can be like heart palpitations, nervous disorders, sleep disorders, and so on. So you have to take a look at the phytochemical as, as an entirety. Uh, it blocks the effects of estrogen and insulin on cancer development as well. So ask your doctor about this if you are uh, interested in ingesting this as a phytochemical and, and some of those dementias as well, the Parkinson's and the Alzheimer's diseases of the brain. Improved mood and depression as well. And athletes use caffeine as a um, athletic enhancer as well. Other uh, negative effects of excess caffeine. So let's talk about the negative sides of uh, negative effects or the side of caffeine. Um, it increases blood pressure, anxiety, like I mentioned, nervousness, sleep problems or disorders, a feeling of unusually strong heartbeats or pal even heart palpitations. Uh, tolerance to caffeine over time um, can be a bad thing too because on high amounts it can negatively affect the body uh, directly with what the above states. Um, abrupt withdrawal can cause headache, fatigues, irritability within 20, 12 to 24 hours, um, similar to like uh, people that are on drugs. 
Other negative aspects of caffeine, medical issues for adults and children when excess caffeine taken in popular caffeinated energy drinks and alcohol plus caffeine beverages. Some students have told me they feel jittery and it could be due to the caffeine. Um, the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration has banned the sale of beverages containing both caffeine and alcohol combined, just so you know. And both Canada and the U.S. have set limits on the amount of caffeine that can be added to energy drinks just to prevent them from adding too much to the point where it affects human health. Now, if you're an athlete in here and you are overseen by an organization, some organizations uh, say that when their athletes are tested, have a blood test, they should not have a certain amount of caffeine over a certain limit because that explains that they're maybe addicted or using too much caffeine as an athletic enhancer. So let's go over some general recommendations of food sources of phytochemicals. So I want to mention that the dietary guidelines for Americans, which are national guidelines for Americans on how to eat and live healthy in general, recommend that people consume ample plant foods um, in general from fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. And when we look at myplate.gov, again, myplate.gov is a tangible tool made for the dietary guidelines to be implemented. They recommend that you fill half your plate with vegetables and fruit when you're eating. Um, the American Cancer Society also recommends eating about two and a half cups of fruits and vegetables every single day, um, keeping in mind that it should be for an array of colors. So food sources of phytochemicals, again, some of the top five um, and other leading sources of phytochemicals, uh, tomatoes, carrots, oranges, and strawberries are some of the highest. And other leading ones include some of the berries, corn, some of the leafy greens like spinach and lettuce. Um, we see raspberries and also uh, one of the most consumed fruits like bananas as well. I do want to mention some interfering factors in foods. Um, so some healthy foods contain some substances that can interfere with other factors. So for example, oxalic acid, which is found in a lot of your dark green leafy vegetables like spinach, kale, mustard green, most healthy ones contain oxalic acid. And then whole grains, seeds, dried beans, and nuts contain phytate or phytic acid. And these substances both uh, can bind to zinc, iron, calcium, magnesium, and copper and reduces their absorption. So my uh, rule of thumb for you is, um, is to maybe not eat them. For example, um, you can find iron in beans and iron in meats. So maybe do not ingest those dark leafy greens um, with your beans or with your um, meats in order to separate the effects. Um, so you can eat these foods, just maybe separate them when you eat them so they're not you know, interacting with each other. Uh, also, you can cook them. So when you cook a lot of plants, um, a lot of them release some of this phytate or oxalic acid. Naturally occurring toxins in foods. So you guys, a lot of food, a lot of plant-based foods contain natural toxins because when they are being, when they're when they're growing in nature, uh, they need to combat certain environmental factors that can eradicate them, like pests and insects. And uh, so they have these fighting um, these substances that help them fight against these environmental stressors. Um, solanine is a bitter tasting insect repelling phytochemical. And it appears as green colored areas on potatoes. It's found in leaves and stalks of potato plants. It's harmless in small amounts, but it may interfere with nerve impulse transmission in large amounts. Cyanide is found in cassava root, which you see here. Um, a lot of ethnic groups uh, use this, uh, for example, like Af some Africans. Uh, soaking cassava roots three nights in water removes some of the cyanide. So there are ways to remove some of these toxins so that when it's uh, for human ingestion, it's no longer there. Cyanide overdose causes the disease Conzo, which is permanent spastic paralysis. Um, other toxins is a key fruit is the national fruit of Jamaica and has killed hundreds. Um, and it's yellow fleshy part around seeds. It tastes like butter, but it, it looks like scrambled eggs. And it can cause vomiting and a rapid drop in blood glucose levels as well. Another example, which is not plant based, but um, Japanese um, um, also have a very unique way, very intricate way of removing some of the toxins from like the puffer fishes, for example. So there's this regard to the puffer fish. Um, they are very educated, um, very knowledgeable on how to prepare puffer fish um, in order uh, to remove the toxins and it's edible for human consumption.